I'm excited to be here to talk about empowering our students to dream big. Because to me, what that means is that we're empowering our students to work towards a better world. One that is more just and more equitable, one that's more sustainable and kinder. And so this past year, as I've traveled around the country, people have asked me what my priorities are as a teacher and what matters to me. And I've told them that I believe education can be a tool to work towards social justice. But one day last summer, I logged onto Twitter and I saw that a fellow teacher had taken issue with these beliefs. He told me that the purpose of education is to educate and teachers shouldn't be social justice warriors. His final argument was, I teach my subject. But I reject that simplification because teachers don't just teach subjects. We teach people. People like these. These are some of my students. And when our students walk through our classroom doors, they don't leave their identities there at the threshold. Their experiences in our rooms are bound up in historical context. And so if we insist that education happens in a vacuum, we do our students a disservice. We teach them that education doesn't really matter because it's not relevant to what's happening all around them. So here's one example of what it can look like when kids do see the connection between school and life. For the past several months, students from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida have been advocating for stronger gun laws. And they're not the first or the only kids to do that work, but they've been launched into the national spotlight for taking on politicians and lobbyists and special, special interest groups and media personalities. Their activism reminds me what can happen when our students have access to a great education. And when they understand that that education can help them work towards building a world that they want to live in. One of the teachers at the Stoneman Douglas High School is named Jeff Foster. And he's been teaching there for 20 years. He teaches AP US government. And on the day of the shooting, his lesson was focused on special interest groups. Coincidentally, part of the lesson had students looking at the typical response of the NRA following a mass shooting. And the next day, students were supposed to take a test where they demonstrated their understanding of those tactics. And then the shooting happened. And in those terrifying minutes, and in the days and the months that have followed, the intersections between what students learned in class and what they would need to know in the real world became abundantly clear. Three days after the shooting, Emma Gonzalez gave a speech while she was holding a big sheaf of papers that were her notes from Jeff Foster's class. And she and her classmates were so fiercely well-spoken that they were accused of being crisis actors. But they're not crisis actors. They're kids. There's kids whose teachers have empowered them to understand that they can use their education to engage. Jeff Foster did an interview and he explained why he loves to teach government. Because it's alive, he said. Stuff is happening. Jeff Foster and his students are just one example of what can happen when teachers believe that what we teach matters beyond the four walls of our classrooms. So, yeah, social justice belongs in our schools. Social justice should be a part of the mission of every school and every teacher in America if we want liberty and justice for all to be more than just a slogan. Schools are crucial places for young people to become active citizens and learn skills to work towards a more equitable society. And I'm gonna let you in on a secret. Many of the skills that people need to orchestrate the kinds of change that lead to social justice are already built into the work of school. Problem solving, critical thinking, collaboration, perseverance, none of this should be all that revolutionary on its own. Now combine that with an ability to understand history, not as one static objective narrative on which we can all agree, but as a series of intertwined events about which there can be countless interpretations. If as teachers, we deliberately choose to explore history with our students rather than just teach it, then we help them understand history as ongoing and as tied to current movements for change. We help our students see themselves as potential players within a living history. So those are the skills I'm talking about. When I talk about equipping our kids to do social justice work, those are the skills of well-rounded scholars and of active citizens. 
And teachers are the ones who will help young people make the transformation into the kinds of citizens who can use those skills to affect change. Okay, so back to my new friend on Twitter. Maybe one of the reasons that he wasn't happy with my work is because he and I don't agree on the definition of justice. Maybe we just don't see eye to eye politically. And to me, our interaction actually speaks to a larger problem in America right now, which is as adults, we don't often know how to disagree in a way that moves us forward. But here's the thing, as teachers, our aim is to empower students to articulate their own opinions not to coerce them into agreeing with us. So it doesn't actually matter if he and I agree on what justice looks like. What matters is that we're helping our students have those conversations with one another. And that means as teachers, we've got to learn to become effective facilitators of our students' activism. We need... <laughs> So we need to teach them how to have tricky conversations. We need to expose them to differing opinions. And we need to help them see the connections between what they're learning in class and their own real lives. So I'll give you an example of that from my own classroom. I teach ninth grade humanities. And every year, my students and I explore the history of apartheid in South Africa as a case study of injustice. If you don't know the history of apartheid, basically, it was a brutal and racist system under which everyone in South Africa was categorized according to race and people of color were oppressed. Uh, resisting that racism meant risking one's life. And around the world, other countries' governments, including the United States, hesitated to do anything to sanction South Africa because we benefited from its resources. And then in 1976, the South African government passed a new law. And the law required that students in South Africa had to learn in the language of Afrikaans when they went to school. But Afrikaans was a white language spoken by white South Africans. And many black South Africans referred to Afrikaans as the language of the oppressor. So as you can imagine, students of color were outraged at this new law. They already attended segregated schools, where they had overcrowded classrooms and a lack of resources and a frankly racist curriculum. And now, they were being expected to learn in a language neither they nor their teachers spoke. So they decided to do something about it. On the morning of June 16, 1976, thousands of kids of all ages walked out of schools in the township of Soweto, and they marched through the streets, holding hands and singing and holding signs to protest the law. They came to an intersection, and they encountered the police and the military, who ordered them to turn back. And when they refused, the police set dogs on them. And then they opened fire. Although the Soweto uprising ended in tragedy, and although apartheid itself wasn't officially struck down for almost 20 more years, the students' protest had a dramatic impact on the way the world viewed South Africa's policies. News outlets all around the world published a now iconic picture of one of the very first people killed by police that day. He was a 13-year-old boy named Hector Peterson. And it became nearly impossible to ignore the brutality of the apartheid regime. In the years that followed, more and more countries exerted political and economic pressure on South Africa to end apartheid. And it was due to the activism of those kids in Soweto. So every year, my students explore this history. And they look at the ways in which these South African students exercised their agency within an oppressive system that sought to silence them and deny their humanity. And invariably, my students draw comparisons between the South African kids' activism and their own power and promise as young people. They start to wonder about their own political agency. They debate whether they would be really willing to risk their lives to ensure that future generations could live in a more just world. And they ask themselves whether adults like us will ever listen to their voices. So a few years ago, in the wake of Michael Brown's death in Ferguson, Missouri, my principal received an anonymous email from one of our seniors and informed him that the following day, students at our school were going to walk out and participate in a citywide protest in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. And at that point, staff at our school had a decision to make. Would we try to stop them from protesting? Would we use our authority and our power to try to control them? Or would we put into practice these principles of social justice and activism that we had been teaching them about? 
So the next day, most of the student body left school en masse, and they gathered on the lawn. And my favorite part was when one of the seniors jumped up on a picnic table and started going over safety expectations for all the younger kids. <laughs> and as teachers, we gathered with them, and we listened, and we told them to stay safe. And then a whole bunch of the kids marched off to meet up with other kids from other schools downtown, and the rest of the kids went back inside the school. And those who had chosen to stay at the school that afternoon talked about the Black Lives Matter movement, debated the merits of protest, and went on with class as scheduled. And those who walked out participated in a citywide student rally and raised their collective voice for justice. But no matter where they had chosen to spend their afternoon, our students learned really valuable lessons that day. They learned that the adults in their lives would support them even as we worried for their safety. They learned that they didn't need adults to tell them how or when or where to organize. They learned that they were members of a community of young people with a shared vision for a more equitable society, and they learned that they had power within that society. And most importantly, they learned that events like the Soweto Uprising aren't ancient history, and they don't have to end in tragedy. And that's what education as a tool for social justice can look like. And our kids are ready for this kind of work. In 2015, there was a survey of college freshmen. 8.5% of them said that there was a very good chance they would participate in a student protest sometime during their college career. Now, that might not seem like a really impressive figure, but it's actually the highest number of kids to say this since 1967. And in that same survey, 75% of them said that helping other people who are having difficulty was a very important or an essential life goal. And again, that's the highest number of kids to say that since the late 1960s. And research shows us that activism doesn't just follow from helping students develop the skills that I talked about earlier. It actually works the other way, too. It helps our students build skills, like critical thinking and leadership. And it correlates positively with their political participation and their civic engagement and their commitment to their communities later in life. So in other words, students are telling us that social justice is important to them. And researchers are telling us that it helps students learn. And so now it's just up to us to listen. And that's where this gets really, really tricky. One of the students who participated in the Soweto Uprising in 1976 said later that that event represented divorce between black children and their parents. Because their parents had grown up under apartheid. And they knew how dangerous it was to speak out. They'd seen their friends and their family members, their political leaders like Nelson Mandela jailed or killed for resisting. So they wanted their kids to lay low and stay safe. And when our kids threatened to walk out at my school, the adults in our community were really conflicted too. Some of us worried that they would encounter violence when they left the school. And other people fretted that, you know, they wouldn't really know why they were walking out and they would defeat the purpose of the whole thing because we don't give them enough credit. And other people worried, and this included a bunch of students' families, they worried that we didn't do enough to stop them from walking out, that we should have done more to keep them in school. And all of this fear that we have as adults of getting this wrong makes a ton of sense. But despite our fear, we have got to prove to our students that we will listen to their voices. It's up to us to inspire confidence in them that they do have the power to affect change. It's our responsibility to ensure that they're equipped with the tools to insist on a more equitable society and then get out of their way as they work to apply those tools to situations that they care about. Living up to that vision will require creativity and flexibility. It will require standing against those who seek to silence or delegitimize dissenting voices. And it will require accepting the fact that sometimes we will be the ones our students rebel against. Sometimes they will point out ways in which systems that we have designed or in which we are complicit are actually contributing to inequity. It will be uncomfortable and it'll be painful as they push us to question our own assumptions and beliefs. But what if we change the way we think about rebellion in our kids? Because really when our students rebel, when they thoughtfully push against our ideas, when they, when they question whether there's a better way than the way that we've designed, what if we chose to see that as a sign that we're doing something right? and That our kids are becoming liberated? I know it would be easier 
if our kids' critical thinking skills manifested in more convenient ways, on their standardized tests or their essays, it was very neat and clean, right? But convenience and justice don't often go hand in hand. When our students think critically about the world around them, they learn to become engaged citizens who will question injustice when they see it and work to change it. And welcoming rebellion into our schools is going to require some rethinking about what learning looks like. Because there's this misconception that if we give students any wiggle room, they're going to walk all over us and pure chaos will ensue. And if we expect students to just sit silently and passively receive knowledge from us, then yeah, their voices are always going to feel overwhelming. But if we accept instead that learning is sometimes messy, that it requires opportunities to discuss and brainstorm and get it wrong and try again, if we accept that students dislike chaos as much as the rest of us and they want to learn when they come to school, then we can set up schools to facilitate that kind of education. Imagine schools where adults are thought partners, helping students make wise decisions but not always supplying the right answers. Imagine schools where we trust students to make choices and allow them to experience the consequences of those choices. Imagine schools where we make it our mission to treat students as individuals, with all of the uncertainty and the messiness that is bound to come with that. Imagine schools where we believe the writer Rebecca Solnit, who wrote that activism itself can generate hope. These aren't mythical or idealistic visions. I know that those of you in this room know that. Teachers all over the country are already pushing the boundaries of what teaching and learning look like with amazing results for kids. And we know they're doing that in charter schools, they're doing that in traditional public schools, they're doing that in private schools. There are teachers sitting in this room right now today who are doing this work. There are countless models for teachers who want to get better at helping students learn in a more authentic, engaging, and empowering way. I was reading this book by Ted and Nancy Sizer. It's called The Students Are Watching, and in it, they argue that the work of education is often framed as a collection of nouns, like respect and honesty and integrity. And those nouns, they say, sound really impressive, but too often they fail to actually mean anything in practice. But verbs, they write, are active, no less demanding, but requiring constant engagement. They're not structures, but rather engines. And so as I read that, I wondered, how can we turn the noun of justice into an engine driving our work as teachers? What's the verb form of justice? I've decided maybe the answer lies in the words of Dr. Cornell West, who wrote that justice is what love looks like in public. Love's a noun and a verb. School has to be bigger. It has to mean more than I teach my subject. School has to be about teaching people to change the world for the better. And if we believe that, then teaching will always be a political act. We can't be afraid of our students' power, because their power will help them make tomorrow better. But before they can do that, they have to have opportunities to practice today. And that practice should start in our schools. Thank you so much.